lesson is love the way of God. <clears throat> and in our in our world today, you know, we have lots of things, but we don't have enough love. We got too much of a lot of things. And you know, in society at large and really in the power centers, people that run things, they look on Christians as haters. You know, they, they say, oh, you're haters. You know, if you, if you stand up for the scripture, if, you, <laughs> if you're Bible believing, they're gonna call, you know, say you're a hater because you stand against certain things that they like. So that's, to them, that's hating. Well, we know, we know different, we don't hate. We do know things are wrong and we don't mind saying so, but, well, I guess I should say we, we do hate sin. We hate sin and all ungodliness. There's nothing wrong with that. But we don't hate or condemn the people. People are many times are confused and uh, deceived because we live in a world of deception. <clears throat> and you know, now we're, we're facing, what, in two weeks we're facing an election of course, that just brings out the division and, uh, I guess, outright hate in some, some uh, centers. But uh, it seems that half the country, you know, is on one side and half the other, and then it, there's not much, um, not much agreement, a lot of division. And after this is over, uh, half will be... I guess maybe celebrating that and probably half will be very upset. <clears throat> and I wrote in here because I remember probably back in the 70s there was a song out, What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love. <clears throat> and that's, that's very true. And love comes from God. It's a gift to man. And, you know, we must not neg neglect the gift. When we're given something like that, if we don't exercise it, <clears throat> we lose it. It's like, just like your body, if you don't exercise, you grow weaker. And if we don't exercise that gift, it will not be very effective and kind of go away. <clears throat> First scriptures, 1 John 4, uh, chapter 7. We'll turn quickly there. 1 John 4. <clears throat> And it says, Dear friends, verse uh, 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. <clears throat> and God is love, and His very laws, you know, that many really don't like to think about. Uh, the Ten Commandments are based on love, love and obedience to God, and love and respect for your fellow man. <clears throat> verse 11 it says dear friends since God so loved us we ought to love one another no one has ever seen God but if we love one another God lives in us and his love is made complete in us and uh, verse 16 and so we know and rely on the love God has for us God is love Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. <clears throat> Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in, in love. And Verse 20, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen and he has given us this command whoever loves God must love his brother and of course we know how that goes <laughs> many times you see all kind of uh, contention between even brothers and sisters in Christ brothers and sisters and their families so we need to exercise the love more than we do <clears throat> And uh, 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> 1 
1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. And now I will show you the most excellent way. Of course, this is Paul speaking. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So we begin to see just uh, how important that love is. Can't really, if you don't have love, there's not much good you're going to do at all. And in verse 4, it kind of describes love, what love, what, what he's talking about when he's talking about love. Love is patient. <clears throat> love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Uh, you know, if if we insert our name there in place of love, we, we can kind of do a self-examination. And most of the times we'll say, mm, I got work to do. Verse 6, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always per, uh, perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. And you know, that's another thing to remember. We study and do our best, but we're, we're not perfect. We're not perfected yet. <clears throat> but we do the best we can. And verse 12, it says, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then, he's talking about when Christ returns and I guess the restitution of all things. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And I think we all know that, but uh, it's something that you just have to... Uh, Keep in your mind and keep working on. <clears throat> you know, uh, Matthew 24, 37 and 40 tells us, speaking of God's commandments, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, maybe it's, we'll turn there quickly. Matthew 22. Verse 22:37. And here's talking of uh, the Pharisees that asked Christ, "What's the greatest commandment?" They, they were trying to entrap him, I guess, in something. Uh, hearing that Jesus silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got up together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question: "Teacher, which is the greatest commandment?" In the law, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is likened to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So we said, as we said earlier, God's law is love. It's, it's based on love. Of course, in Matthew uh, 5, it even said we must love our enemies. And hey, that's kind of hard to do. Matthew 5, 43. 5, 43. <clears throat> Verse 43, you have heard it, it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And you know, that's, that's, a, very, that's a difficult thing to hate your enemies. Uh, I think it's 
good to keep in mind that we're all made in God's image. We're, we're all children of God, and we hope to be sons of God very in God's family. So when we think about it that way, you know, we may not agree, and we may, but we know that God loves humanity. He so loved the world, or he so loved humankind that he gave his only son. So when we put it in that, that perspective, we say, yeah, we can see that. That's something we need to do. <clears throat> and uh, just a ending thought. Let's, I like to always look forward to the future for some reason. Uh, <clears throat> it's all going to be easier one of these days. Let's turn to Isaiah 11. We all know that what that says ahead of time, but... Uh, it's really not. I like that. I like to look forward to, especially in the times we live in, I like to be able to look forward to, to something that's really, really nice. Uh, if I can ever get on the right page. Okay, Isaiah 11, uh, verse 9 and 10. Well, I want to go up in verse 6 and start, though. It's talking about a time when Christ returns sits on his throne, rules, rules the earth. Verse 6, Isaiah 11, verse 6, says the wolf, and this is some of the conditions that, that will be existing at that time. Everything will be in harmony, the way I like to put it, even the weather. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. Verse 9, they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We have the opposite uh, effect existing today the earth is full of deception from just about every quarter but then the earth will be full of knowledge and Satan will be banished uh, and I think we'll, it'll be a wonderful wonderful place then and we will have love everywhere thank you and now we'll hear uh, the title of this message is why watch the world spiritually why watch the world spiritually um, you're gonna say what do you mean by spiritually I mean you watch world events social political but you're also watching for spiritual things and we talked about this in the previous sermon by spiritual I mean we cannot see the spirit world so we don't know what they're doing but we can see the effects of their trampling over things in other words I call it the tracks of the dragon. If you look at world events, you say, you know, this is a devilish direction. Um, this is a very devilish direction we're going in, a very devilish direction. And you realize, oh, you sense the tracks of the devil. There's a lot of chaos in the world today, in Europe. Our media doesn't cover it, so I go on the internet, not, not do anything special, but I get a lot of stuff from foreign sources. And if you're getting your news from ABC, NBC, you're getting mostly propaganda, maybe a little real news, but much of what's going on in the world is really neglected. Um, and they, of course, are propagandists for worldly far left causes. I, I, they even admit it, you know, 90 some percent all vote one way, so you get an idea. So <clears throat> we want to be well-informed watchers. One of the traps that Jesus warned about, uh, warned us about, we're going to go to Luke 21, 31. We're going to look at one of the traps and watching the world that Jesus warned us about and watching prophecy and watching for the return of Christ. So when you're watching for the Messiah's return, he, Luke 21, 31. So you also, when you see these things happening, 
know that the kingdom is near. Verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. In other words, all the predictions in both Old and New Testament about the return of the Messiah will not fail. But here's what I think Christ is warning about. There, there are lulls between events happening, or at least you think they're lulls. Like, if you're an American, you're probably unaware of all the upheavals in Europe and other parts of the world because our media doesn't cover it. You may not even have heard about the explosion in the pipeline, which could, depending on how bad the winter is, have thousands of people in Europe freezing to death and blaming America for it. I mean, if you're not listening to international media, you wouldn't know that. So my point, and that's prophetically very valuable because America, because one, one of the things we believe in prophecy is that a, America will no longer be the hegemony leader of the world. It will be a Holy Roman Empire in Central Europe. Maybe that's starting to happen. America and Europe are being unhinged. We just don't see it because our media doesn't cover it. But still, you, have, you believe there's a lull in events, and you think, well, nothing's happening. I think I'll go back with the world, backslide a little bit, and then I can have a, a last second repentance when I see Christ coming back. So he warns, verse 34, Luke 21, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with uh, different translations, use different words. I'm going to go with this one. Uh, the New King James, carousing, drunkenness, cares of this life, the day comes on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare to all who dwell on the face of the earth. In other words, it's going to grab the world and catch them totally off guard, and they won't be prepared for the end-time end events. Verse 36, watch therefore and pray always. In other words, Christ is saying, watch events in society, both spiritual, cultural trends, and political trends. Watch them, because they're key to the return of Christ. And pray always, pray every day, whether you want to or not, that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things, which come to pass and stand before the man, stand before the Son of Man. I don't think he's saying, earn your salvation, but, but he is saying, Stay close to Christ. Try to be as godly as you can. And of course, the grace of Christ will help. Um, and uh, so don't let us get lulled into, I use the Baptist term, backsliding. I like, by the way, that's in Jeremiah, so it's not an unbiblical term. Backsliding. Let's slide back into the world. Uh, Matthew 24, 46. The same topic is mentioned again in Matthew. Matthew 24, 46. Jesus says, Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. I'm emphasizing the word so doing. I think he's saying, no matter whether you think there's a lull in spiritual events or not, we have to keep doing the right thing. You know, coming to Sabbath services, keeping annual Sabbaths, trying to obey the Ten Commandments. Um, and I know there are a lot of badly world influences, resisting them as best you can and, and repenting as needed. Doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. In other words, we're going to help Christ, part of his cadre, to rule the world in that paradise that Carl Hill was referencing in Isaiah 11. Verse 48. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. In other words, there's a lull in events, or I think there's a lull in prophetic events, whether it's true or not. And Christ won't be back for maybe 20 years. Oh, that's plenty of time. I think I'll backslide into the world, and maybe I can have a deathbed repentance, or, you know, as soon as I know he's coming. By the way, it's easy to think you can turn on a dime. I will become as worldly. I'll get in all the bad addictions of this world and horrible things, and I could just repent and spend on a dime. You may not be able to do that. Don't, I'll put it this way, don't take the devil's snares lightly. He's grabbing people and, and drugs, pornography, weird uh, atheistic philosophies, all kinds of things that I probably don't fully understand myself. 
They tell me that a high percentage of young men have dropped out of the labor force and they're spending more than like eight to 10 hours a day watching screens, mostly video games, but a lot on their smartphones, computers, and they just find ways to get government money or play the system, live off their parents. and They're being hooked. They don't know it. And their work ethic is being corrupted. And you know the devil's got to love that, right? He's corrupting them. We don't see it, but he is. So don't, you know, backsliding is dangerous to all of us. Verse 49, and he begins to beat his fellow servants to eat and drink with the drunkards. Not there's anything wrong with drinking, but it's the drunkard part. The master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking. And when not looking means he's not watching world events. He's not watching the spiritual trends in society. He's not looking at anything. He's as blind as the world is. For him, <clears throat> not looking for him, and at an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him asunder, and he'll be with the hypocrites. In other words, Christ is saying, you better watch or you'll be caught off guard. And I want to link the second coming and being ready for it, and to backsliding, to watching events. One reason we name our magazine the 21st Century Watch, we want to watch events as they transpire. There's a lot of stuff, even though it's not a church publication, the Buffalo Gap. It's watching world events. Uh, you may not agree with all the writers in there. They're not all in the church, but it's, there's some interesting things in there that you don't hear any place else. Believe me, I've been reading it anyway for years. Um, and our discussion of events and our Bible study, I think, is good for us, even if we don't always know what's going on. Thinking about it is good for us, if, if you understand what I mean. Um, for instance, a lot of especially liberal Christians, I heard them discussing this on the radio, uh, have this philosophy. It's my truth and your truth. Doesn't that sound good? My truth, your truth. But what that really means is there is no truth. It's, it's kind of narcissistic. The truth is anything I want it to be. And that's what the world, including many, I'll call them leftist Christian churches, are pushing. Well, it's your truth. Uh, if you want to believe that you're a different gender, uh, I can say I no longer see myself as a, never mind, I'll get into it because we'll offend somebody. Put, but all kinds of things I could say, well, that's my truth. But that's not the truth. It's crazy stuff. Um, so how can we guard our hearts and learn to love God? The key is learning to love God with all our heart and to love the truth, whether it's popular, whether it makes you feel good or not. Love the truth. For instance, a lot of people don't want to think we're headed for a recession. We are in a recession. I'm not saying it's bad yet, because we talked about at the feast that we still have better food prices in many countries in the world. And we have better fuel prices. I think in England it's 11 or $12 a gallon for gasoline. We're better off than a lot of places in the world. Not all places, but a lot of places. In other words, it could be worse. But um, we are in a recession. You might as well face it. And probably, and this is, this is speculation, it will probably get worse for a while. That's a truth you need to live with. I told people, if you can save a little extra food, do so. You never know. We could have, maybe not here in the middle of America, but in some places, like California, some other place, you might have days without power, depending on how the winter goes. And by the way, you know, they can't pump gasoline when the electricity goes out. You may not be able to go anywhere, buy any food, so um, there are bad things coming. In spite of, I know our government says there's no inflation. It's great move. <laughs> anyway, gaslighting. Don't look at what you're looking at. Look at what we tell you. Anyway, First Thessalonians two nine through eleven. This is maybe the key scripture. First, second. I mean, Second Thessalonians two nine. Second Thessalonians two nine. 
The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they do not love, they have no love of the truth. Why are they perish? They do not love the truth. Tell us what we want to hear, what we want to believe. We got itching ears that, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. You want to believe a lie and you don't want the truth? That's going to happen in the future of mankind. God's going to let them be deceived. The best defense against deception and watching truthfully is love of the truth. Develop a love of the truth, whether it's pleasant or not. This is a real short, cute joke, but it kind of makes a point. The joke is called Confound It. This big, burly person walks into a doctor's office. The doctor says, sir, the patient snaps back. Excuse me, doctor, it's ma'am. The doctor says, well, ma'am, hate to give you the bad news, but you have prostate cancer. <laughs> but that's how he wants to see himself. Actually, in the story, there's a picture of the guy Big broad chin, never mind. It <laughs> doesn't look the part, but um, but whatever you want to be. The truth is whatever you think it is. No, it isn't, but that's the world we live in. People are now being taught to love whatever they perceive the truth to be. Love of of God as understood in the Bible, love of the truth, especially if it's something you don't want to hear, it's bad for you. By the way, I had a teacher who gave me a good grade but wasn't really correcting me on some of my microbiology stuff, and I didn't learn what I should have learned. I wasn't actually love to let you get through without knowing what you're supposed to know, not correcting me, if you follow that. And if you're a good parent, you and I know parenting is tough, but if you're a good parent, you try to teach your kids stuff whether they want to hear it or not. That's true love. Um, Psalms 119, 165. I'm going to read this twice, two different translations, but it kind of makes a point. Psalms 119, verse 165. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Another translation. Great peace have those which love your law, and nothing shall offend them. People are so thin, can't easily offend it. I'm woke, and I'm so easily offended. Ah. Kids in college, where well, they should be debating issues, and we can't hear anything that disagrees with what we think. It look, you know, precious little snowflakes. It's crazy. The best way to have no spiritual stumbling block is to have that mature peace of God. And it helps to be watching events from a mature standpoint. And if we are with God, he will not let us be deceived. I want to read this verse because this is a key verse, Matthew 24, 23. This is a crucial verse, and I think we developed a better understanding of it after we finished all our audio problems with the pot last night with this scripture, Matthew 24, 23. I think Stan gave her some really good feedback on this one. Matthew 24, 23, and Ken and the other Ken. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, verse 24, for there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, and show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, now the word if it were possible means it's not possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And here's uh, what we said last night. Why isn't it possible for us true Christians to be deceived? Well, God won't let us be deceived if we're with Christ. Even though, in other words, the deception is going to be great. All the media, maybe the, the beast, super dictator, whatever his name is, super emperor in Europe, the hero, he will stop some wars, he will stop some starvation, maybe he'll come back from being, from an attempt to assassinate him. He'll be the great hero, and the media and the churches will all and everybody will worship this man, you know, the new Hail Caesar. It's coming, and they will deceive the whole world. 
But we won't be deceived. God won't let us be deceived because we've learned to love the truth, love God, and stay with Christ. Uh, why watch? Because it helps us stay alert because we're watching for the return of Jesus Christ. It'll help us stay focused on Christ. And one way to look at it, because you're going to say, well, what about 1 Thessalonians 5? Which, and if you read the first five or six verses, it says watch. Because we're not in darkness like the world, and the end time won't come on us because we're the children of light. And I think what that means is, um, put all the scriptures together, what it means is that we won't be as vulnerable to being caught off guard as the world because we're watching. But there will be a few surprises, and that's why Christ warns us to be careful, to stay faithful. I don't know what the surprise is going to be. If we knew, they wouldn't catch us. In other words, there's going to be some surprise near the end that will even catch many of us off guard. But if we're with Christ and watching, he won't let us be deceived like the rest of the world. Another trap people can fall into is the wolf-wolf trap. And it's prematurely screaming, the end is coming next week or in two years. Or when one guy had a big billboard all over Arkansas. Christ is returning in 1989. I remember that. Just, anyway, um, there, you hear those things. Well, events speed up, slow down, like the, the demise of the communist empire. It collapsed in seven weeks. It sped up. No one expected it. And then it appears that events slowed down. Everybody's saying, well, the end's coming now. Germany will be reunited, which it was, and the beast will rise. Well, I mean, in a sense, Europe united with the EU, but still, it's not the final form. It hasn't happened yet. And I'm going to read Revelation 16, 15 and to make a point. And this is my last scripture. And by the way, the problem with screaming wolf, wolf, is people get burned. Let's say you really believed your church leader and they said it. Well, then in a few years you realize, wait a minute, nothing is happening. These guys were wrong. And then you stop watching, you maybe stop believing, and maybe even in Christianity, maybe even in the Bible, maybe in end time prophecy. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to get burned and disillusioned. If you're a sophisticated watcher of world events or prophecies, you know not to jump at every little thing that happens. We were discussing last night, what if they do build the temple in the next two years? Maybe they even get the altar sacrifices start even before they finish it. You know, the moment they do that, a whole bunch of people will jump up. The end is coming soon. The end, because that's one of the trigger events is when they stop the sacrifices at the altar. But then they build the temple and they sacrifice for five years and Christ doesn't come back. I mean, it's possible. And everybody gets used to that third temple in Jerusalem and forget about it. And then suddenly events happen, catching you off guard. But you were burned because you thought the end would happen five years previously and you stopped watching. All I'm saying is, whatever events do happen, be cautious of screaming, the end is here, it's almost here. People have said that many times, and just be careful. Um, I'm not saying it won't come someday. Obviously it will, Christ said it will, but it's got to be careful about prematurely screaming wolf, wolf, with, with what I call incomplete knowledge. We don't know as much as we think we do. And, and relying on our media, <laughs> well, they don't cover the world like they should. The last scripture, Revelation, Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. In other words, there will be some surprises even for us. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garment. You're watching world events and spiritual events and trends and, you know, even trends in churches and spiritual trends in ourselves. Keeps his garments. I mean, you stay doing the things you know God wants you to do. Lest he walk naked, that means without righteous clothing, and they see his shame. We're not in darkness to be caught off guard by the world. Um, but we will or we might have some surprises. And so we need to buckle down and say, we're going to be like the Boy Scouts, always faithful, 
always ready, no matter what. But some surprises may occur even for us. Um, and there's going to be great deception coming, very great deception. As long as we're watching the world and trying as best we can to do godly things and repenting as needed, we cannot be deceived. Because that's what it says. You know, those that, um, if it were possible, but it, it's not possible for the very elect. You know, Israel is the elect. The church of God is the very elect. We cannot be deceived. God won't allow it. But we must continue to watch and do.